Good morning. A warm welcome to you on this beautiful spring morning. We're glad that you're here at St. John's Lutheran Church today. Please do remember in prayer all the people that are listed on your flyer today, and please take your flyer home with you so that you may remember them throughout the week. If you have a prayer concern or an event that you'd like us to keep in prayer, you may indicate that person's name or that event on the back side of the pew slip in the, um, in the welcome pad. And if you turn those into the offering plates, we appreciate that very much. At this time now, I invite the congregation to please turn inside the front cover of the red hymnal for the brief order of confession and forgiveness. And rising, please face the cross at the back of the church. We gather now in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. God of all mercy and consolation, come to the help of your people, turning us from our sin to live for you alone. Give us the power of your Holy Spirit, that we may confess our sin, receive your forgiveness, and grow into the fullness of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Dear friends, we read in 1 John that if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sin, God who is faithful and just will forgive our sin and will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so let us now confess our sin in the presence of God and one another. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways, to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God in his mercy has given his son Jesus Christ for our sake. And because of Christ, he forgives us all of our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sin. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's join in our first hymn this morning, number 638.
Please turn to page 138 for the Kyrie and the hymn of praise. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to God's people on earth. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, you sent your Son, Jesus Christ, to reconcile the world to yourself. We praise and bless you for those whom you have sent in the power of the Spirit to preach the gospel to all nations. We thank you that in all parts of the earth, a community of love has been gathered together by their prayers and labors, and that in every place your servants call upon your name. For the kingdom and the power and the glory are yours forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated for the readings. The first reading is from the book of Joshua, chapter 5. The Lord said to Joshua, Today I have rolled away from you the disgrace of Egypt, and so that place is called Gilgal to this day. While the Israelites were camped in Gilgal, they kept the Passover in the evening on the 14th day of the month in the plains of Jericho. On the day after the Passover, on that very day, they ate the produce of the land, unleavened cakes and parched grain. The manna ceased on the day they ate the produce of the land, and the Israelites no longer had manna. They ate the crops of the land of Canaan that year. The word of the Lord. Please join in the responsive prayer of Psalm 32. Happy are those whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Happy are those to whom the Lord imputes no iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. While I kept silence, my body wasted away through my groaning all day long. Then I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not hide my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Therefore, let all who are faithful offer prayer to you. At a time of distress, the rush of mighty waters shall not reach you. 
You are a hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with glad cries of deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you where you should go. I will counsel you, my eye upon you. Do not be like a horse or a mule without understanding, whose temper must be curbed with bit and bridle, else it will not stay near you. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, O righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. heart. Amen. The second reading is from the book of 2 Corinthians, chapter 5. From now on, therefore, we regard no one from a human point of view. Even though we once knew Christ from a human point of view, we know him no longer in that way. So if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that is in Christ God was reconciling the word to, world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting the message of reconciliation to us. So we are ambassadors for Christ, since God is making his appeal through us. We entreat you, entreat you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please rise for the reading of the Holy Gospel. Gospel according to St. Luke, the 15th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to Jesus, and the Pharisees and scribes were grumbling and saying, This fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. There was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that will belong to me. So the father divided his property between his two sons. A few days later, the younger son gathered all he had and traveled to a distant country. And there he squandered his property in dissolute living. When he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout that country and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. The boy would gladly have filled himself with the pods the pigs were eating, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired hands have bread enough and to spare, but here I am dying of hunger. I will get up and I will go to my father and I will say to him, father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. So the boy set off and went to his father. But while he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. Then the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, Quickly, bring out a robe, the best one, and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet and get the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate for this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found and they began to celebrate. Now his elder son was in the field 
And when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. He called one of the slaves and asked, what was going on? The slave replied, your brother has come and your father has killed the fatted calf because he got him back safe and sound. The older boy became angry and refused to go in. His father came out and began to plead with him. But the boy answered his father, Listen, for all these years I have been working like a slave for you, and I have never disobeyed your command. Yet you have never given me even a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came back, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him. Then the father said to him, Son, you are always with me. And all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice because this brother of yours was dead and has come back to life. He was lost and has been found. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. I invite all the kids to come forward this morning for the children's message. Come on, guys. Come on up this morning. As you come up, please take one of the green backpacks right here. This is, uh, take one for each of you, okay? This will be yours to take home. Good morning, good morning. Tim, are you not coming up this morning, Tim? Quentin, you want to come up? You should come up this morning, Quentin. I'm telling you, you boys are going to want this stuff, all right? Believe me, you're not too old. You're fourth grade, Quentin? Do we get to do First Communion next year? Fifth grade? Okay, so fifth grade is the official time that you can start to consider not coming up for the children's sermon. That's when you're too old. Um, but if you wanted, really all of these people out here aren't so old that they couldn't come up for the children's sermon either. Now, if you were to take a long journey, Quentin, did you grab a bag? Okay. Um, all right, I need a bag too. If you were to take a long journey, okay, you would probably want a bag to travel with, right? Wouldn't you, wouldn't you pack a bag? If you were taking a long journey, these are string bags. These are a new invention since I was a kid, and I still struggle. I always struggle to figure out how these backpacks work. I think it's like that, right? And so you would put it over one, one shoulder, and then you'd grab the other strings, right, and carry it like this. And then you could go hoboing all over the country. You could walk from New York to San Francisco and from Austin, Texas up to up to Ely, Minnesota. You could walk all over the country, couldn't you? Oh, of course you could. You could. You really could. It would take a long time. But that's what some people used to do, okay? Well, today we have a gospel story about a boy who was the younger of two sons. And he was, oh, well, I don't know what was going on in his life, but he said to his father, Father, I want my inheritance. I want half of everything. He had this other brother, so half would go to the younger brother and half would go to the older brother. But he said to his dad, I know you're not dead yet, but I want half of the entire inheritance that you would give me. And would you know that the father did just that? He was still alive, of course. The father was alive, but he gave the boy half of everything. And so the boy took what he had and the things that he couldn't pack up and put in a bag and take with him. He sold, and he took that money, and he put it in his bag, and he went off. He left. He intended to be gone forever. He left his father. He left his home. He left his property. Now, if you were to go on a long journey, you would probably want to take some water, wouldn't you? Right? Did you see the water in the bag? And you would probably want to take some food. Did you see... My favorite snack, the Cheez-Its. I know you do. That's why I got them. Who doesn't love Cheez-Its, right? Told you you should have come up for the children's sermon. All right. And uh, there's a few other things in here too. But if you're on a journey and you want to arrive at a specific place, a destination, what is this? A map. And how would this help you on your journey? You would know how to get there. Exactly. So if you open up your map, go ahead and take it out right now. All right. You'll have to put it back in a second. 
If you open up your map, you'll see the compass. Look at the compass side, okay? This is a big coloring page. I had so much fun doing this. Isn't that, don't you wish that you'd come up for the children's sermon? All right? So this is the journey that this prodigal son took. He left his father's house and he wandered all over the country and he wasted all of his money with parties and just crazy things. And he wandered, he walked through valleys and mountains, and he was lost. He didn't have a map. He really didn't know where he was going. And the time became really tough. There was a famine, which means nobody had any food. And there was drought, so the water was very scarce. And he had nothing. He had wasted all of his money. Right, that's a journal for you guys too, okay? So you can write down your prayers. And it got so bad that he had to feed the pigs. You see the pig pen down here? I know, you would if you had to, because he didn't have any food. And he would, he would have been glad to just eat the pig food. Can you imagine eating pig food? That's how hungry he was. Yeah, well... <laughs> I don't know if you would like pig food either. I think, I think your brother is on to something there. And so at that point, the boy said to himself, look how far away he is from his home. He said to himself, you know, my father's hired hands, they aren't starving, and they have a safe place to live. I will go back to my father and I will apologize. And so he starts on his way back, and he goes through more country and he crosses rivers and he goes over mountains till finally he comes back to his father and what does his father do what's his father do there macy he kisses him and hugs him and he says welcome home now if you were to take a journey turn over to the other side turn over to the other side right what things would you need quentin what do you think you would need on a journey Food, yep. And what kind of spiritual food would you need? What's in the middle of this? Your Bible. You would need probably to take your Bible. If you wanted some protection along the journey, maybe you should have a good friend, right? You'd want prayer. You'd want to know that you could come back to a loving Father, God in heaven. And of course, you know, you have a home that you live in, but we also call the church your home too. So these are things you can fold up your map. You can fold up your map and put it back in your bag that if you were to go on a journey, you would want to take along with you. So put your map in your bag, put your bag on your shoulder, okay? And once you've done that, then you can fold your hands, okay? And we'll say a prayer. All right? So let's pray. Dear God, thank you for giving me everything that I need for my journey. But most of all, Lord, thank you for giving me Jesus. Oh, Lord, help me, follow along with me, lead me and guide me so that I may always come home to you and know your love. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks, everyone. You may be seated. Well, dear friends in Christ, grace to you and peace from God our Father, who loves us and welcomes us home. Amen. In just a few weeks' time, St. John's will gather to celebrate Easter, the resurrection of our Lord. We will gather for the 125th consecutive time. The joy of that first Easter Sunday 2,000 years ago is undimmed in the hearts of those who long to see Jesus, who with Mary and Peter and John run to the tomb and dare to peer inside. He is not here. He has been raised, the angel declares. But go, you will find him just as he told you. And for two millennia, that is exactly what the church has done. It has gone out to the world to declare the good news of Jesus, that by his name everyone may be saved. 
For 20 centuries, the church has confessed Jesus as the way, as the only way to be saved. It has done this for people who have never heard of Israel or its Messiah. It has shared the good news, knowing that those who were sent might well be going to their deaths, because those who went were regularly persecuted, beaten, struck down, and starved. They were jailed unjustly and held without trial. They were ridiculed and slandered. They were maligned and called impostors of the worst sorts, though they were as innocent as doves. The brave men and women who went knew these dangers, and yet they volunteered without hesitation. Faithful men and women trusted God with everything, and they were willing to, ri to risk anything sharing the good news of Jesus for people of different religious beliefs and for those of no belief at all. In the United States this Easter, Christians worship in safety and peace because of the bold trust of faithful missionaries and the tireless efforts of those who labored upon the foundation of Jesus. Each made great sacrifice so that you may believe, and some made the highest of all sacrifices for your faith, laying down their earthly lives. Why did they do it? Was it to win a heavenly prize? No, it was to embolden your faith, your faith in Christ alone. It was to assure you of your salvation in Him alone. That's the work of the church, emboldening your faith, assuring you of your salvation in Christ. Don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying that the church creates your faith. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. The church's job is to preach Jesus so that you may hear, and hearing by the Spirit's power, you may believe. But if the church fails to preach Christ, then who will? Will the world proclaim Jesus' saving love? St. Paul asks, how then will people call on Him, call on Christ, in whom they've not believed? And how are they to believe in Him of whom they've never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? So faith comes by hearing, and hearing comes through the Word of Christ. The church's job is to proclaim Jesus so that you may hear the good news, be moved by the Holy Spirit, have faith in Christ, and so be saved. Sometimes I'm asked, Pastor, why have you left the ELCA and why do you think our church should? Some ask this question with curiosity, some with concern, some with anger. It is an important question and you have a right to ask it of me, your pastor, if only to inform whatever decision you wish to make. Simply put, I have withdrawn from the roster of the ELCA because of its 2019 policy, a declaration of interreligious commitment. At first blush, the policy seems benign, but when one reads carefully, a number of questions must be asked about its statements about how Christians are to relate to people of other religions. The policy says on page 7, and I quote, religious diversity, when accompanied by mutual understanding and respect, enriches the whole, close quote. This seems like a nice thing to say because understanding and respect are part of the golden rule. But the question to ask is, how do other religions religious diversity, enrich Christianity? Or more personally, how does Islam, Buddhism, or any other religion enrich the Christian faith? So the fundamental question becomes, is this what God wants? The policy states that religious diversity is God's will and gives seven biblical examples on pages 12 and 13 of Gentiles, that is, non-Jews and other non-Christians coming to God and Jesus, implying that these religious beliefs are God's desire. 
But read the context of each example from the Bible and notice what happens in every case. The person recognizes that the God of Israel is the true and only God and that Jesus is the only Messiah, the only name under heaven who gives salvation. And how does each example conclude? With a person being moved to God in faith and moved to follow Christ. And that is precisely the point. It is only through the one true God and only through the name of Jesus specifically that this faith is created. The Apostle Paul, who is arguably the epitome of what it be what it means to be moved to faith in Christ by the Holy Spirit, he emphasizes this point in Philippians 2. He writes, Therefore God exalted Jesus to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of the Father. Such is the work God has given to the church to proclaim this good news to people of all beliefs the world over. So it begs the question, does God want all people to come to faith in Jesus? Historically, the church has not hesitated to give a clear answer. Yes, God does want all people to believe in Jesus. But the 2019 policy states, And again, I quote from page 14 this time, we must be careful about claiming to know God's judgments regarding another religion or the individual human beings who practice it. Close quote. So now I must ask, does God want all people to come to faith in Jesus? Or has he changed his mind? Later today, We will enjoy the blessing of worshiping with Bishop Lorna and receiving Holy Communion together. I hope you'll come back for her presentation after worship at 1130. We will come to Christ's table as the family of God, receiving Jesus' body and blood. And though it is true that afterwards the bishop and I will walk separate paths, I hope that we will always think of one another as friends in Christ. As we are to take divergent roads, Bishop Lorna has the invitation, and I hope she will take the opportunity to tell the congregation how it is, if she does believe so, that other religions enrich Christianity, or why it is that the church should not be concerned for all people to come to faith in Jesus, as the policy states. But if those are not her beliefs, then I would invite the bishop to go back to her peers to her fellow bishops, asking that the policy be rewritten. And I would ask her to lift up to Bishop Eaton, the primary bishop, the historic confession of the Christian church, that Christ's name alone gives life and salvation. I would ask Bishop Lorna to remind her colleagues that yes, we must be sensitive and thoughtful in how we share the good news of Jesus, especially with people of different religions, recognizing how challenging it is to share the gospel with others. This is true. But we are compelled to share God's love in Christ Jesus alone for the whole Bible. The very word of God testifies that Jesus is the only way God chooses to be approached. Our Heavenly Father longs for us to approach Him in this way, to return to Him, coming to our senses like the prodigal son, like that wayward boy, that we might throw ourselves at his feet only to have him raise us up and weeping upon our necks. God embraces us with his timeless love. Come home to the Father. His Son beckons us and leads us. Jesus is no begrudging older brother reluctant to see our place in the household restored No, together with the Father and the Spirit, He rejoices over us and lifts us upon His shoulders and carries us home. Jesus shows us the Father's mercy and love and kindness, just as He does for all the world. 
like the prodigal son, we wander off in our foolishness, and yet our Father receives us home without hesitation. Like the unforgiving brother, we are tempted not to forgive one another, but in the Father's forgiveness, we can live in love all the rest of our lives as one family reunited in Christ. Forgiveness for one another and unity with God are so because of what Jesus has done. Only Jesus has done this, as only He could. He is the path to God. Yes, that path is narrow, but it is more than wide enough for all people and every nation, for all lands, and for every person. Yes, there is but one path to God, Christ Jesus, but it is a path God invites all to walk, and it is upon this road that He stretches out His hands, that He might sustain and strengthen us, that He might lead us and bring us home, that we might take His hand. He stretches out His hands to all the world, because in Christ, God turns away from no one. The policy statements in the 2019 Interreligious Declaration that other religions enrich us and that we must be careful about claiming to know God's judgments about other religions or the persons who practice them. Simply, these statements do not have a basis in the Bible. God does want all persons to come to faith in Jesus. And other religions do not enrich Christianity. Period. These statements show the heart of what the ELCA believes and the direction it is headed. If your belief is that religious diversity does enrich your Christian faith, then the ELCA is for you. If you believe that God is not concerned for all persons to come to faith in Jesus, then you will feel at home in the denomination. But if these are not your beliefs, then you must ask, is the ELCA the place for my family and me? When I am asked, Pastor, why did you do this? My answer is simple. At my ordination, I vowed to teach and preach in accordance with the Scriptures as the Word of God and in accordance with the Lutheran confessions of the Church. I have kept that vow all of my years with you and every year since my ordination. My conscience is bound to the Bible. I must confess Christ alone as the way of salvation. I have done this because I have no other choice. I have done this so that you may know God's saving work in Jesus alone and knowing you may choose for yourself. May the peace of Christ, which passes all understanding, may it guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Please join in hymn number 510, Word of God, Come Down on Earth.
Please rise as we join our hearts in prayer. Let us pray for the whole church on earth and for all people according to their needs. O Lord God Almighty, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, grant us, we pray, to be grounded and settled in your truth by the coming of your Holy Spirit into our hearts. That which we know not, reveal. That which is wanting in us, fill up. That which we know, confirm. And keep us blameless in your service. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We give into your hands, O you, Jesus Christ, the great physician, all those who need comfort and strength, healing, encouragement, and wholeness. Especially we ask your blessings upon Mel, Les, Morgan, Scott, and Kay. Watch over Kevin and Dwayne, Doug, Denny, and Steve. Stay close to the side, O Lord, of Dennis and Sandy, Chase, Judy, Adam and Amy. Pour out your Spirit, Lord, upon Keith, Todd, Diane and Todd, upon Christy and Sharon and Stu and Ron. O Lord, remember your promises for Dieter, Tyra, Lily, for Dylan and Cade and Moni and all those whom we name now in our heart of hearts. Lord, to these your children, give the fullness of your Spirit. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Pour out your Spirit, O Lord, upon Dallas Raymond Verbesky, that in his baptism he may receive you and know Christ's salvation. Strengthen him, Lord, in faith. Bless his parents, Jeremiah and Danielle, in their love for one another, and bind them together as a family in your holy love. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O oh Lord, we pray for peace in Ukraine, for peace with Russia. We ask, O oh Lord, that you would change the hearts and minds of those who would do violence, that you would keep their hands from wicked things. O oh Lord, strengthen and bless those who defend their country. Watch over the innocent, shelter the weak, and be with the aged. Let there be peace soon, Lord, and let peace come today. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for all those who till the land and work the soil. We ask that by their labors you would bless all creation, that being good stewards of what you have made and called good, they would bless all people and the world over. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Into your hands, O Lord our God, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you all. I invite you to share Christ's peace with one another. Please be seated for the offerings.
The Lord be with you. Let us pray. God, our, our provider, you have not fed us with bread alone, but with the words of grace and life. Bless us and these your gifts that we may receive from your bounty, our Lord Jesus Christ, for we pray all this in his name. Amen. On the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body that is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Then, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this for the remembrance of me. And so, remembering our Lord, together let us pray as he has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Now the table is set and all is prepared. Our Lord says, come and dine. Please be seated, coming forward at the direction of your ushers.
And now may the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ keep you and strengthen you in His grace. Amen. Let us pray. We give you thanks, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through the healing power of this gift of life. And we pray in your mercy that you would strengthen us through this gift in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's join in our sending hymn number 547. Go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.